system is so deeply rooted in our political, economic, and social structure that it's not just going to fade away. Uh, we are going to have to engage in real movement building in order to trigger a dramatic shift in the public consciousness. All right, well, let's talk about that because you say it's not through token tokenism or tankering, tinkering, I think is the word you use, that this change will come, but something much bigger. And I'm wondering if there's hope, as you see it, in the fact that there are many groups beginning to feel the, the lash of the incarceration system in different ways, but under the first George Bush and then Clinton, you saw spiraling rates of female incarceration. I don't think any group was affected more by mandatory minimums than women. Um, you now have people with debts finding themselves treated or, or you know, asked to take credit rating tests for very basic jobs in the same way that felons are uh, you know, marginalized in the workplace. More and more white working class people with debts find that they can't get a job. Are there possibilities for alliances there? Or is there no getting around we have to grapple with race? Well, I think there's absolutely opportunities for broad-based coalition building. And you know those opportunities must be pursued, absolutely. But if we fail to deal with the racial anxieties and racial divisions and the racial politics that birthed mass incarceration, and which have repeatedly birthed caste-like systems in the United States, if we fail to deal with that, even if mass incarceration fades away, a new caste-like system will be born, one that we may not be able to foresee today, just as mass incarceration was literally unimaginable just 40 years ago. Um, as long as you know these divide-and-conquer type politics um, are allowed to play out, and we have not yet forged durable, sustainable uh, alliances between poor people of all colors and a recognition and a full appreciation of our racial history and the harm that it has caused not just to African Americans and poor people of color, but to all folks. Um, these kinds of caste-like systems, I believe, are going to continue to emerge. So I believe it's our task not just to end mass incarceration or the war on drugs, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. What, is, what are the radical perspectives on this today? You talk about back in the um, Reconstruction era, there were kind of conservatives and liberals and radicals. And mm -hmm. the conservatives and liberals had different versions of this is an individual problem or a circumstances problem and the radicals presented a really different analysis like yours. Are there groups today who represent that um, bigger change view? Oh, I think so, absolutely. And what's interesting is, you know, people like Angela Davis and Ruthie Gilmore, who've been doing, you know, wonderful work on this for many years and, you know, who describe themselves as abolitionists are defined as radicals, but their view that uh, we ought to do away with prisons entirely was actually a mainstream view in the 1970s amongst criminologists. You know, in the 1970s, mainstream criminologists thought that all of the research, available research, suggested that prisons actually caused more crime than they solved or prevented, uh, and that they had proved themselves relatively useless in our society and many people thought prisons were going to fade away and that we would deal with dysfunction in communities in alternative ways. Uh, so it's interesting that what's dubbed today as being radical was once uh, quite mainstream. When crime was nothing like what it is today either. Um, where do you see the kind of change you're looking for happening? Is it happening anywhere? Well actually I want to say though that crime today is you know at the lowest level that it's it's been practically since they started keeping track and so there is a widespread public perception that the quintupling of our prison population is due to crime or to crime rates when it's just not true over the past you know 30 years crime rates have fluctuated have gone up have gone down today you know as bad as crime rates may be in some parts of the country crime rates are actually at historical lows but Incarceration rates have consistently soared. So 
you know, this system of mass incarceration cannot be explained by crime or crime rates. It's a change in policy. It's the, a change in our response to people who we perceive to be criminals, um, not a change in crime rates itself. Take us back to the Jarvis Cottons of the world. When they get out of prison, they've done their time, they've served their sentence, maybe they're on parole, maybe they're even not on parole anymore. Um, what's life like for them? Life is, it is difficult to survive. I think, you know, most people have this general sense that, oh yeah, you've done time in prison. Yeah, things, you know, probably difficult getting back on your feet. And nothing could be a greater understatement. You know, when you're released from prison, you, first thing on your mind is how am I going to feed myself? Where am I going to sleep? You're released from prison, you're barred from public housing barred from public housing, and you can be discriminated against in the private and public housing markets for the rest of your lives. Where are you supposed to sleep? If your family lives in public housing, if your partner, your children are living in public housing, you want to go home to your kids, to your partner, your loved ones? No. Your family risks eviction if you even go home to them. How do you feed yourself? You're a drug offender. Food stamps may be off limits to you in a number of states. And for the rest of your life, when you try to go get a job, any job, you've got to check that box on employment applications, asking that dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? It doesn't matter if the felony happened three weeks ago or 35 years ago. For the rest of your life, you've got to check that box, knowing full well the odds are sky high. Your application's going straight to the trash. And you could have debts. We joke about or talk about the Chinese system of charging the family for the bullet when someone's um, executed. But we charge ex-felons, too. I didn't realize that. Absolutely. People released from prison are often saddled with hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And then in a growing number of states, you're actually expected to pay back the costs of your imprisonment. And then get this. If you're one of the lucky few who actually manages to get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs, accumulate back child support. What do we f expect folks to do? You know, I said, what's the system designed to do? It seems designed to send folks right back to prison, which is what, in fact, happens the majority of the time. If the prison also requires people to work and work at very, very low wages, is there not a profit motive? for this prison system that you describe? And if so, how do you unravel that? It's pretty yeah. entrenched. Well, there are all kinds of profit motives now built into the prison system. And you know, mass incarceration wasn't born with profit in mind. The drug war wasn't declared uh, with profit in mind. It was born of racial politics. But now, <laughs> uh, it's become abundantly clear that a lot of money can be made uh, you know, from prisons. And it's not just corporations who outsource to prisoners <laughs> rather than to foreign countries, um, but it's also, you know, taser gun manufacturers, private health care providers who provide typically abysmal health care to people in prison, phone companies that gouge prisoners and their families. Um, there's a whole host of corporate interests that now benefit uh, and profit um, from the caging of human beings. And of course, private prison companies now listed on the New York Stock Exchange um, benefit and profit as well. I'm not feeling hopeful here, but you believe that it is possible for us to stop this cycle of, of, of emancipation and de-emancipation. Uh, you believe that a new type of civil rights movement can be born. Absolutely. How? And what kind of work can people engage in if they want to be part of that? You know, what, what's discouraging to me is that when I talk to people in the civil rights community who say, we've just got to be practical, we've just got to be realistic, you know, we've, we've just got to you know, play the hand that's dealt to us, and, you know, there's only so much that can be done given current political realities. And I am so grateful that the freedom fighters who came before us did not have that kind of attitude. Uh, that the courageous freedom riders, uh, the civil rights activists, um, who risked their lives 
um, believed that a different America was possible. And they brought Jim Crow to its knees when everyone said Jim Crow would never die. And so I firmly believe we can build a movement to end mass incarceration, a human rights movement for education, not incarceration, for jobs, not jails. It won't be easy, <laughs> but none of the struggles uh, that have been worth waging in the past were easy either. And uh, I, I think we're at a turning point right now. I believe that there is a growing interest in uh, standing up against the system of mass incarceration, insisting that we turn the page on these cycles, um, these caste-like systems and cycles in America. Why do you care so much about them? You could be doing all sorts of civil rights law. You could be doing exactly the kind of litigation you described at the top. Why take on this huge historical challenge? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know where my first calling came from, but I do know that after working in the communities, hardest hit by mass incarceration and seeing their own courage and perseverance, trying to hold families together, trying to survive, still having faith, unable to get a job, cycling in and out of prison, you know, they inspire me. They inspire me. And, uh, you know, I feel like if someone like Susan Burton, who, you know, herself um, struggled with crack addiction after her son was killed and cycled in and out of prison for 15 years could finally you know get clean and de de dedicate her life to ensuring that no other woman would have to go through what she went through cycling in and out of prison barred from housing unable to find work and open safe houses for women and commit her life to organizing on their behalf she can do it i can do it too and what about the rest of us out here who may think the job market is hard enough, at least we don't have those felons to compete with, this system's working for me, I don't want to unravel it. system isn't working for most people. You know, you may think it's working for you in the moment <laughs> if you can pour, pay your mortgage payment today and put gas in your car, um, but most people today are not that far away uh, from the system not working for them at all. And uh, I think it's becoming more and more clear today that as our government again and again backs up the truck to deliver, you know, tons of money to Wall Street and bail them out over and over again and turn a cold shoulder to the people who are struggling and who put them into office, that something about this system is broken. Uh, and uh, I believe that collectively when we make up our minds to do it, we can fix it. Michelle Alexander's book is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness.